morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. It's nice to see you here. I'm in the UK. It's a slightly sunny, cloudy morning. It's not too bad. So with the weather done and dusted, you see British through and through, um, let's talk about the topic for today's session. So we're focusing on reading and listening skills and how we can really and truly develop them and, and help our learners to develop them. Um, so I'd like to start off by thinking about what a typical reading and lesson looks like in your classroom now. Um, obviously, every lesson is going to be slightly different because uh, you're going to have different reading material, different, different listening material, so the topic will be different and the activities you do will be, will be different too. However, I do think there is a set of lesson stages that we tend to go through when teaching reading and listening. So I'd like you please to just take 10 seconds just to think about what happens in your reading and listening lessons. What do you do first? What do you do next? And then, and then. So 10 seconds of silence just for you to think and reflect, please. Okay, so. In my context, so I'm private language school in the UK. Uh, I've also worked in other countries, Japan and Italy. So um, that's my particular context. But I think that this is a typical receptive skills lesson. So you start off with a lead in, the purpose of which is to activate uh, engagement, to activate interest in the lesson, in the content of the material, um, to activate existing knowledge and also any language that learners uh, know about this topic ready for them to actually listen or read more effectively and of course the idea is that we need to, we're basically setting context aren't we because in the in the outside world when you pick up a newspaper and you see a headline you sort of get an idea of the type of language you'd see or what it is that you're going to read about because you, you'd have some probably background knowledge about that story from somewhere else or something like that uh, in the classroom there is no context so we have to create it then there's a, oh, let's go back. We might actually pre-teach some vocabulary, uh, vocabulary that might prevent understanding of the text, reading or listening. Not all teachers do, but some teachers might do that. Then we do a gist task. So uh, the idea here is to help learners to listen or read and just get the general understanding of what the text is about. So again, it's sort of, you know, making up for the fact that there's no real context in the classroom. So it's helping them to hear the voices, to understand who's talking to who and what they sound like, or just getting a general idea of, of a written text. Then there's some kind of detailed task, and this is usually with comprehension questions. So multiple choice, true, false. And the idea is to check understanding. And then there's some kind of follow up task, and that is usually a discussion about the topic within the material, uh, or it could be looking at vocabulary or maybe even moving on to grammar and doing some practice of grammar from the text. So when I have given this session face to face, pretty much all the teachers in the room from various countries will nod and go yes, because this is what uh, course books tend to follow, certainly general English course books. Uh, it's been like this for a long time since the, um, the communicative language approach really sort of uh, I took hold of language teaching and um, it's also really what new teachers are taught on CELTA. So I think there are some slight issues with this. Um, not, it's, I'm not saying we should do away with this completely, but I'm saying that we should um, consider whether this is the most effective thing for developing reading and listening skills. So I'm going to make a, a suggestion. Um, oh, before I do that, actually, I just want to share with you a quote. Oh, no, that's going to come later. Let's look at this first. Let's look at why uh, there might be slight issues with this particular approach here. Let's imagine that uh, the reading, the, the listening material uh, that we're going to use in our classroom is four separate discussions about four different local landmarks around the world. So we're going to start off with our gist task, uh, sorry, our lead in where learners look at the pictures and say where the places are and maybe what people think about the local landmarks, maybe doing some prediction there. And then they might do a gist task where they listen and um, uh, sort of say if they're correct, their predictions were correct. And then there's some kind of comprehension activity, maybe multiple choice questions, for example, and then a follow up. What is the learning outcome of that particular listening lesson? 
By the end of the lesson, students will what? I'm going to give you 10 seconds again to think about it. So learners follow a typical listening lesson staging that we looked at. They listen to these four discussions. The learning outcome at the end of the lesson is that students will, what will they have done? This is quite a difficult question and when I ask it to teachers they do actually sit and look like that because it is tricky and the answers I get tend to be uh, that they'll learn some new vocabulary and that is true if we actually uh, use the follow-up stage to look at some vocabulary in context then learners will learn some new vocabulary that they will hopefully uh, hear again in future and it will help them to understand future recordings or maybe text as well so that is very useful they also say that um, learners will discuss local landmarks and they will. But that's actually a speaking objective. It's not really a listening objective. So my question is, at the end of the lesson, what actually is the listening outcome? And if we do comprehension questions, the, the learning outcome is basically students will have understood four conversations about landmarks. They'll have answered the multiple choice questions, hopefully getting the majority of them right to show that they understood it. And that's fine, but that's practice. It's practice and it, to some degree it's testing that they can already do it. But where is the development? Where do we actually help learners to develop their listening skills and actually be able to improve them on future occasions? And this is where the John Field quote comes in that I'd like to share with you. So John Field has a book called Listening in the Language Classroom uh, where he talks about um, the problem with what he calls the comprehension approach and this is the approach where we ask comprehension questions. He says that the chief problem with an approach based on one text after another, so we do one text in one lesson, another text in another lesson and so on. The chief problem with that is that the learning that occurs is localised and may not extend to future listening experiences. Learners are given feedback on whether their answers are correct or not, they are sometimes allowed to hear problematic passages again, but that does not mean that they will take away from the experience the kind of generalized technique that will enable them to avoid a similar problem of understanding if one occurs in future. So where are we actually helping learners with generalized techniques that will help them to listen better? With these steps that we looked at, with the lesson stages we looked at, I don't think we do. And so people are starting to realize this and, and people are really, particularly with listening, listening uh, development seems to be a really key thing at the moment. I'm going to suggest to you an approach that we can take with both listening and reading. I'm gonna focus mostly on listening in this session, but we will look at reading at the end, I promise, but it is very similar. Um, I'm focusing more on listening because I think to some degree, listening is a more difficult skill to develop because um, the recording comes and goes so quickly and learners can find listening very, very hard. So my approach is, it's, it's not that dissimilar to the staging we looked at, uh, it's just a bit of tweaking. The first thing I'm going to do is have a very clear learning objective. This is what I hope my learning outcome will be. It doesn't always work out that way. Uh, in the lesson, learners might find something difficult, we might go off on a different tangent, but it's my intended learning outcome. It's not that students will understand a conversation, it's going to be more than that, it's that students will be better able to recognise agreement and disagreement between speakers in a conversation. So I've taken a kind of sub-skill and we're going to focus on that. So one aspect of listening I'm taking and we're going to focus on that particular aspect of recognising agreement and disagreement. Okay, so here's my lesson staging. We're gonna do the lead in and the gist task, just as I described before. Learners look at the pictures, they talk with a partner. Where do you think these landmarks are? What do you think local people think about them? Do they like them, not like them? Why, why not? They predict, they discuss, and then the gist task is to listen to the four conversations and match each one to the photos. So they can listen and check their predictions at the same time. So learners have we've activated their, their knowledge of, you know, uh, these particular items or, or 
potentially what these items are in the picture and also we've activated relevant language relevant vocabulary and so on and hopefully engage them in the topic and then they've they've had a, a general understanding of the the content and also got used to hearing the speakers voices now i would normally do my comprehension question detail task but actually i'm not i'm going to focus on the sub skill and the first thing i'm going to do with the sub skill is actually give them some help with that how can they actually identify or recognize agreement and disagreement in the conversation uh, so it could be like a strategy or tips or um, probably useful language that they can listen for now obviously what language you focus on depends very much on the level of your learners this is a2 plus uh, so it's very simple kind of agreement and disagreement phrases I agree, you're right, that's true, I disagree, I don't agree. Uh, and then the, the good old, you know, yeah, but and then complete disagreement. But the confusion of the yeah or the yes or you're right, uh, I agree to a point that can be a bit confusing for learners. So we're looking at that particularly useful language. Uh, as you go up to higher levels, you might look at things like intonation. So where someone goes, yeah then you know that actually they don't really agree with you fully or mm, something like that. Um, so it really depends on the level of the learner, what kind of tips or language you're going to look at. But anyway, here we're looking at those particular phrases. Now, the next step is actually practicing uh, this particular sub skill. We've made them aware that there's this language and now I want to pra uh, learners to practice listening for this particular language. Um, there are different ways to do this. There's no right or wrong way. This is my particular way. I know teachers have different ideas and that's fine. But what I want to do, first of all, is just get learners to hear the phrases, not necessarily to have to think about what they mean at this stage, but just to hear them in fast speech. When I say fast speech, I mean for their level. Um, it's obviously going to be you know, appropriate for their level. Uh, so it could simply be um, they could listen to the conversations and they could number the phrases in the order that they hear them. That would be one way of doing it. In this particular exercise here, they're going to listen and write the word that they hear again to piece together the phrases. So they're listening for those particular phrases. Once students have had practice in hearing the phrases in kind of faster speech, and again, you might want to do some pronunciation practice. So I agree, you've got the y sound there, I agree, um, which can be a bit off-putting, for example. You're right, you're right. So the kind of shorter version of you're not you're right, but you're right, and the stress. So we can actually give them some practice of that when we look at the, the language on your screen now and then we can give them practice of actually hearing it. Once they've heard it and filled in the little mini conversations there, they can then think about what do they mean and has the speaker actually agreed or disagreed with the person beforehand. And that just gives them a, a, a reason to sort of think about the meaning now. Once they've done that, we can actually move on to maybe a, a longer conversation. So actually, learners have listened to three of the conversations again. Now they're listening to the fourth, but this is a longer conversation. And first of all, in order to know if learners, uh, if speakers have agreed or disagreed with each other, the first thing we need to do is actually identify what opinion the speaker has given. Uh, so this is what happens here. So there's a, I think in this particular conversation, it's just an example, but there are six opinions given during the conversation. Uh, here's a couple of them on the screen. Uh, Katie believes that the model cows, so these are the painted cows uh, that were in the picture of Warsaw before. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they travel all around the world uh, in city centres and they're discussing whether they like these cows or not. Uh, so they have so learners listen and identify the opinion. Katie believes that the model cows are in the right place or the wrong place. So they choose that to establish what opinions each of the speakers have about various aspects. And then the next step is to listen again and identify whether they actually agree or disagree with each other. So now they're listening for the phrases again and actually interpreting them at the same time. So uh, it's a bit of a step by step approach, but here the practice is on the sub skill. It's not just general comprehension questions. It's focusing on that agreement and disagreement. And by doing this, learners show that they have understood the text. 
because they've identified the opinions and they've identified the agreement or disagreement. So that's pretty much what you would need to understand from that conversation. And then, of course, there can be the follow up activity where learners talk about a local landmark in their area, whether they like it, dislike it and so on. So. This is the approach that I'm suggesting at the moment we're talking about developing listening skills. So we have our lead in as normal. We have our gist task as normal for learners to get to recognize the general content of the recording and to hear the, the accents and the voices and the speed. Then we're not going to have comprehension questions, but we're going to focus on the soft skill. We're going to give them some kind of knowledge of language or a strategy or something like that that will help them. And then we're going to give them some practice where they're focusing on that particular sub skill. And then there's going to be a follow up task. So by the end of the lesson, learners will be able to identify from the practice and how well they did. They'll be able to identify with whether they achieve the learning outcome or intended learning outcome of the lesson. And hopefully they did with your help. Um, because we had the focus on the sub skill and we staged the practice so that it was listening to just for certain things at first and then building up to listen to the whole conversation. But hopefully they can take that strategy away with them and use it in future listening. So they might need more practice of that, of course, but it's not just a sort of a one time listening. Did you understand it? Yes, you did. Well done. Did you not? Mm -mm, never mind. Better luck next time. But it's actually, hey, do you think this can help you next time? How might it help you? And actually, hopefully it will start to develop their listening skills. So let's think more about what listening sub skills might be. So here's a list of just some of them, really. So we're thinking about the kinds of things that we do when we listen in English or well, when we listen in any language, actually. So we have recognizing agreement or maybe even conflict. We might identify the speaker's purpose. Why are they coming to talk to us? What do they want? Identifying the main point of a conversation or a um, some kind of talk, for example identifying a speaker's opinion and also the reasons for their opinion, the supporting ideas, are they, are they persuasive? Are they going to persuade you or, or are they a load of old rubbish? Are they coming up with uh, examples that just don't really um, uh, give evidence for their opinion? Certainly as you get higher in level, you need to be a critical listener, don't you? You need to be able to think critically about what you're hearing. If you're listening to a story, an anecdote, you might need to follow a sequence of events. You might need to identify a speaker's attitude. So how do they feel about something? Are they disappointed? Are they frustrated? Are they annoyed? So, you know, that would come with intonation, I think, very much as well as particular language. Inferring information. Uh, we, uh, we read between the lines, but we also listen between the lines making connections between information that the speaker's given you. Maybe in a meeting, several speakers are speaking and you're having to make connections between what they say. Maybe we need to identify uncertainty. So a speaker saying, well, yeah, it might, might happen, or I guess I could, uh, a language like that, that will identify that they're not very certain about something. So those are just some of the sub skills that we might want to focus on in our listening lessons. And hopefully by focusing on some aspects of perhaps useful language, like I say, looking at phrases for uncertainty, looking at intonation for speaker's attitude. If you say something like, um, you know, that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, one of those is sarcasm and one of those is real enthusiasm and, and excitement and listening and recognizing the difference between the two. So if we can help learners with those particular areas, then when they're listening, hopefully they'll be able to listen better. There's also decoding skills. And this is a topic that lots of teachers are starting to talk about. Um, it's not a new phenomenon. You may be familiar with the, the terminology of top down listening and, and bottom-up listening or bottom-up processing. Um, 
the idea that uh, top-down processing is the idea that we use kind of context and um, facial expressions and body language to help us to decode a message. A really good example of that actually is a few years ago I was running a training course it was on technology and I was sat at a computer I'd sent all the trainees off for coffee and I was sat at a computer with headphones on trying some a video or something and one of the trainees was still in the room and she got up and she walked towards me and she went I didn't hear a single word she said so there was absolutely no processing of language there whatsoever no decoding no bottom-up processing it was all top down I looked I understood the context I looked at her facial expression and the fact she was pointing to a watch and I knew she was asking me what time she needed to be back so I told her and she was satisfied with the answer so that's a perfect example of top-down listening but bottom-up listening decoding skills or micro skills is where you you start at the very bottom, you hear the sounds and you build it up from there. So first we discriminate between sounds and we put those sounds together to identify words. Um, but then when we're listening to fast speech, we also have the problem of linking where we, we link words together. And sometimes we add sounds, sometimes we leave sounds out. So um, getting helping learners to identify word boundaries can be very useful. Where does a word start and where does a word end? And we'll look at something to do with that later. Learners also need to, well, what we do when we're decoding is we decode stress and intonation. They help us to identify key information. We also recognize weak forms. We recognize that the sound uh, for example, could mean ah, uh, it could mean uh, as in the article uh, um, and we kind of dismiss it as being nothing too significant because obviously we're focusing on the, the content words, aren't we? And that's where the stress comes in. We listen for the stressed words because they give us the meaning. Um, but these weak forms can get in the way if you don't actually understand what, why do they keep going? Uh? <laughs> it just sounds so strange. It actually, it's a word that you see in a grammar, you know, we're going to go to the cinema tonight and then they hear, we're going to go to the cinema tonight. Well, we are, it's just a weak sound. It's so small. And so it can be a bit confusing for, for learners. Uh, we might recognize the function of discourse markers. So when we hear someone say, but, we predict what that they're gonna give a contrast. When they say, and, we know that they're gonna add more information. So we use those discourse markers to help us to actually see where the conversation is going next. We might recognize functional language and phrases that can, we can identify those. Uh, and I'm sure many of you know people who, when you're talking to them, they finish your sentence for you. And how do they know to do that? Because when you're a very competent speaker of another language, you are able to predict what comes next. You knew what I was going to say next because it, it's chunks of language that we use regularly, collocations and so on. So uh, we use those skills, but we don't see these skills necessarily being taught in course books. Um, but that seems to, well, uh, I'll show you later, but I think that's something that we're starting to address. So um, we've got there, we're looking at the listening. Uh, so we've looked at some sub-skills, if I just go back to here. So some of the sub-skills, and then we've talked about, uh, and we looked at the particular lesson on uh, recognising agreement and disagreement. So we've looked at how we might stage that. And then we just talked a bit about, or I've talked a bit about decoding skills. And now I'd like to suggest a staging for focusing on decoding skills. It might be a little bit different, but slightly different. But I'd like you to see how that might look in the classroom. So our intended learning outcome for this particular lesson is that students will be better able to recognize weak forms in speech and understand a radio report. So the thing with decoding skills is that when you focus on the decoding skills, it helps learners with listening to fast speech, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that they've understood what they heard. Whereas with the uh, activities we looked at focusing on agreement and disagreement earlier, they did tell us that learners understood. So here we've got two uh, outcomes or intended outcomes. One is recognizing weak forms in speech and the second is understanding a radio report. So um, we've got our leading and our task. So here it could be, here's a picture. Look at the woman. So where do you think she lives? Um, what do you think life is like there in winter? How different do you think it is 
from your life and students discuss it in pairs and they compare and then the gist task is listening to a radio report about living in cold countries and uh, they can compare their ideas their predictions that they made so that's the lid and the gist task just as we wouldn't do a normal in a, in a typical listening lesson that we do now but now we're going to focus on the sub skill and when we're looking at decoding, I think one of the things that learners really need to do is notice. They need to notice that um, words and phrases are pronounced in particular ways. By noticing that, it just it helps them to, I think, absorb it, understand it and internalize it a little bit more. So here we're focusing on weak forms. So uh, we might look at particular weak forms as some examples on the board. Now, what you can do here is you can take sentences from the recording. So we've had the gist task here where learners listened and checked their predictions. So we've got the audio script. So now I'm going to pull out some sentences from that audio script that contain weak forms. I can try and play them on the recording, but it can be quite tricky. So what I usually do is I actually take the sentences out and I am the speaker for this particular task and for perhaps the practice as well. Um, it makes it easy for me. And I know some, some teachers worry, um, particularly if English isn't their first language, they worry about being the model themselves, but I really wouldn't because learners have to listen to all kinds of accents in English. If they're going to work in business in English, they're going to listen to lots of pronunciation, um, including, uh, including your own and, uh, and others. So I think a, a variety is good. We bring in material from outside of the classroom so sometimes we can use ourselves as a model um, so for noticing here i'm just going to read some sentences so i might say things like okay so how do you think r will be pronounced in a sentence and the students say what they think and then i would say okay so there there are lots of cold days here there are lots of cold days here and then they notice how it's pronounced as kind of a uh, sound um, and you can listen to the model of the recording to, to get the pronunciation because obviously everyone does pronounce things slightly differently. So again, you know, students, how do you think was is pronounced in, a, in faster speech in a sentence? So they predict and say, OK, so it was minus 30 degrees yesterday. It was minus 30 degrees yesterday. So they're noticing that this was sound is actually was. So we'll do some practice of that. So students just simply notice how the words are pronounced. Now we have some practice of weak forms. So now I want students to actually do a bit of practice. So here, for example, here are some more sentences from the, the uh, radio report that they listen to. And now students can listen and fill the gap with the word that they hear. And each of the missing words are weak forms. So people don't need to heat homes in winter. So they're listening for those particular sounds. They can recognize, ah, two is ter, okay, great. And then they don't need to worry about the meaning of it because actually that's not one of the key words to focus on. So this is the practice of the weak forms. And again, I'm reading the sentences here, I think, trying to model the same kind of pronunciation from the recording because then they can listen to the recording for comprehension and hopefully it will help them. Some more activities to help with weak forms. OK, so we're going to sort of try them out a little bit. So um, you're going to need your fingers for the first one. At least I do when I do it. Some people do it amazingly in their head. But a very simple activity to help learners hear weak forms and also to identify word boundaries. So where a word starts and where a word stops is just counting the words in a sentence. So I'm going to read a sentence. So this is from, again, the radio report, a nice, easy one to start with. Can you count how many words in my sentence? And um, well, I'll, I'll leave you to, I'll give you a few seconds to, to think of it. I'll say it twice and then you can count them. Nice, easy one to start. I work in an office. I work in an office. I work in an office. So you should have had five for that one. OK, a bit more difficult this time. You might need two hands. People live in all kinds of unusual places. People live in all kinds of unusual places. People live in all kinds of unusual places. 
So you should have had eight for that one. It's quite tricky um, to hear, but you had all kinds of, all kinds of, all kinds of. So hopefully learners have identified that that's actually three separate words. Um, you can you can read it. You can say it slower. You can say it faster, depending on your students. You can obviously up the level of challenge of the sentence, depending on the learners. If you're taking it from the transcript, it's going to be more difficult for higher levels anyway. OK, one more. It's cold here in winter, but it's also sunny. It's cold here in winter, but it's also sunny. OK, I'm counting it's as one word, but actually I should have said that to you first because that's a bit unfair. Some teachers prefer to separate it. Some teachers prefer to have it as one word. It doesn't really matter. But it's cold here in winter, but it's also sunny. So it should have been nine words or ten if you counted it's as two words. So that's one activity. It's really short. You can just take regularly in your classrooms, pull out sentences from an audio script, read them out and get students just practicing this skill. You can start off by saying it slowly and build up the speed to help learners to develop those uh, decoding skills. The second thing I'd like to do is called an echo dictation. Um, it's going to seem a bit like listen and repeat um, because you're obviously probably sitting alone at a computer somewhere. If you're sitting in a cafe or, or other public place, a staff room or something like that, you might want to do this in your head. But uh, in the classroom, you'd be doing it out loud. It's just, well, you'll be talking to yourself, which maybe you don't mind. That's fine. But anyway, this time I'm going to read a sentence. I'm going to say a sentence uh, and I'd like you to repeat it. So I'm only, I'm only going to say it once, actually. You need to wear sunglasses every day. OK, the next one. We don't spend a lot of time outside. And the last one, it's important to wear lots of layers of clothing. OK, I said that quite fast because I know that you're all going to be very competent. Um, again, I can slow it down. The important thing of slowing it down is obviously to keep it natural. So, you know, you need to wear sunglasses every day rather than sounding like you're reading it. You've got to try and sound as natural as possible. Um, but what I would do in the classroom is a bit different to that because that just seems like listen and repeat, doesn't it? Which is fine. It's something we do quite regularly. Echo dictation is slightly different. You'll put students into pairs. If you have a, a three, that's fine. Um, they can just take it in turns. But you'll have an A and a B uh, and the A's will start. So you read the first sentence. So, for example, you need to wear sunglasses every day. And the A turns to B and echoes what you just said. And B listens and helps them if they need help or checks that they've said it correctly. So there's sort of peer correction going on there, but also support as well. Then you do the next one and B turns to A and echoes what you said and A obviously uh, helps them if they get stuck or repeats it uh, uh, and oh, sorry, cor uh, corrects them or, or tells them that they're correct. And after each one, after pairs have had time to echo and check, I then ask one or two of the A's, for example, to say the sentence again in front of the class and everyone checks that they're correct. And we talk about any particular problem words or something like that. Now, when counting the number of words and when doing the echo dictation, you actually learners are doing a few things. Firstly, they are keeping that phrase in their head. They're using their phonological loop to kind of remember something, which is what we do when we listen. We have that. We always remember the last thing that someone said, didn't we? So when they say, are you listening to what I'm saying? And you say, yes, yes, you were telling me you're going to take the bins out. You didn't hear anything they said before that, but you remember that last sentence because you, you, your memory remembers it so that you can link what comes next to it. So you're kind of helping learners to build their memory, really, which is really important for listening. Um, you're also helping them with the weak forms. So they're identifying and noticing weak forms because when they're counting it, they're recognizing it as a word. And when they repeat it, they have to recognize it as a word because they 
what they're going to say needs to have some kind of meaning. So when they're producing it, they're going to produce it and, and, and understand it in some way. Uh, and they're also obviously hearing the word boundaries as well. Um, the last suggestion is transcription. Listen and write what you heard. So again, you read a sentence and learners write the sentence. So, you know, dictation fell out of fashion, but it's now back in fashion, particularly with helping learners with listening, decoding skills, because it's focusing on the individual words. It's helping them to build up meaning from the sounds, the words, the phrases, rather than relying, which we've done a lot in course books, relying on context building prediction, which are the top down processing skills. Now, so that's quite a lot of practice, but I wouldn't suggest doing all of those in this particular lesson. Those are just some ideas of things that you can do. Um, but um, so let's say that we did this particular task here and then maybe we did one more of these from this list and we did a few sentences rather than just the couple that I demonstrated with you. Now, that hasn't actually shown that they've understood the, the radio report about living in cold countries around the world. So we might actually want to do some comprehension questions here as well, because then hopefully the practice they've done with the weak forms, they can actually use when they're answering those questions. And I've actually made sure that I've chosen questions that focus on particular parts of the speech where weak forms are used, which is actually throughout mostly, but anyway, um, I think making sure that the comprehension questions do actually practice the sub skill as well will be very useful. Then we have the follow up task, which could be, would you like to live in any of those countries that were described in the radio report? Why, why not? And some kind of discussion based on that. And maybe looking at more vocabulary as well. So this is what we've just talked about for listening. So doing a lead in, doing a gist task for general understanding. Then focusing on a sub skill, so giving them some kind of strategy or language that they can listen for, and then practice of that sub skill, and then a follow up task. So, could we use this framework to develop reading skills? I'm hoping you're looking at it and thinking yes, because I think we can do it in exactly the same way. We have a very similar approach to reading in terms of the staging that we talked about at the beginning of the session. And I think that here we can also uh, adapt it in the way that we've done with listening. So let's look at an example. So my intended learning outcome for this reading lesson is that students will be better able to recognise a writer's attitude in an article or blog post. So I'm not just going to ask them comprehension questions to see if they've understood the different parts of the text, but we're actually focusing on a particular sub skill. And here it's identifying or recognizing a writer's attitude. How do they feel about a particular topic or aspects of a topic? And, and here they're going to be reading, uh, I think it's a blog post actually, similar to an article. So, and this is a higher level now, this is B1 plus. So this particular text is called The Key to Success, Ignore Key to Success Books. Uh, so somebody is uh, giving their strong opinion to and their feelings about this particular topic. So we're going to start with our leading and our gist task. So the leading could be read the title of the blog post. Yeah, the key to success, ignore key to success books. And they're going to uh, predict what the author's attitude is to this topic. They might predict reasons for that as well. Then they're going to read the introduction to the blog and check their answer. So they don't actually need to read sometimes just tasks. I don't think you need to read the whole text because the idea is that you're just getting the general understanding of what it is that the text is about, because, again, there's no context in the classroom. So we've done the lead in the gist task and now we're not going to focus on comprehension questions as such. We're going to focus on the sub skill. And here it's giving them help with how to actually recognize a, a writer's attitude. So here are some examples of ways that um, readers can, uh, or things that readers can look for to help them. Extreme words, for example, where the writer might emphasize something that they like or don't like. It's completely crazy. It's a total failure. So of course, they're going to try and persuade you to agree with them. So therefore, they're gonna use kind of extreme language to sound more persuasive. 
Also, attitude adverbs are very telling in terms of attitude. Actually, so I'm saying that other people are wrong. Uh, apparently, this is what people say, but maybe it isn't. Things like fortunately, luckily, sadly, obviously give away the writer's attitude. There are comment clauses which show your attitude to what was just said. So they made $1 million in a day, which is amazing. So you are surprised or, or you think something is incredible. You might use rhetorical questions or tag questions to show that something is obvious and um, that, that you couldn't possibly disagree with the, with the question that you've asked. Again, a persuasive technique. So who wouldn't want a million dollars? So you're trying to sort of persuade the reader to agree with you. And then you've got punctuation as well. So if you use italics or capitals or exclamation marks and they're obviously sort of emphasizing something that you want to emphasize and that might that's going to give away clues to your attitude. So we're giving we're giving learners some some language that they can look for to actually develop this particular skill. Now we need to practice it. Uh, and again, there are different ways that you could do this. I mean, in this particular task here, learners are actually completing these sentences um, from the blog. So they're finding the information in the blog. They're completing the sentences here. And in doing so, they're actually sort of uh, focusing on some aspect from this particular language here. So there it might be an extreme word or an attitude adverb that's missing here in the sentence. Then the learners will work in pairs uh, or they could do it on their own. I mean, um, that's absolutely fine as well. I think often learners need time to process before they discuss it. So they could they then look at each of those sentences from the text and they identify which technique from this box here, from all of this language that we presented to them. They identify what technique was used each time. And in doing so, they then identify what the attitude is. They can say whether the writer thinks it's good or bad, if they like it or dislike it, uh, if they feel frustrated by it, annoyed by it, and so on. They could then discuss that in pairs after they've read, or they could work in pairs and do it from the outset. So that's the practice of the subskill. Then there's a follow-up task. Um, and this is a really nice task. I think this is great. Um, it's helping learners to kind of personalize the, the topic in the text and think a bit more carefully. So they have to choose three of these sentence starters and complete them. Uh, they could do it in writing first and then do it orally, or they could just do it orally from the beginning. But I think they need preparation time, don't they? So I like the post because, or I don't really like the post because, um, I don't really agree with the point about, blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, I'm not sure what the word means in this context. I'd like to find more about. I agree with the comment that and so on. So they choose three of those that they want to use. Then they discuss in groups, small groups, for example. And then that creates a nice discussion about the text. So um, again, the leading, the gist task. The focus on the sub skills, so giving them some kind of strategy or useful language to look for. Giving a practice of that sub skill. And then a follow up task. So just as we looked at with the listening, I think it's absolutely possible for reading. Let's think about what some more reading sub skills are. So again, it's thinking about what we do when we read. We might identify the writer's purpose. Are they trying to persuade us to do something, to believe something. What's the main point of a, a text? Can we identify different opinions within a text, contrasting opinions perhaps, and the supporting ideas? And again, critically analysing those supporting ideas. Are they good ideas or are they full of holes that we need to pick up on when they're being critical? Uh, following a sequence of events, again, in a story, can we follow using grammar or using time sequences? Can we follow the order of events? Identifying the writer's attitude we looked at, locating specific information uh, in a text, inferring information, certainly with higher levels, being able to read between the lines is important. Again, making connections between information and, of course, at higher levels, it's not just making connections between ideas in one text, it's actually 
having two or three different texts on the same topic and making connections between them or contrasting them, for example. And again, identifying uncertainty. Uh, a reader, a writer is expressing maybe some views, but are not sure about it. So those are some of the sub skills that we might want to focus on in reading. Again, it's just some of them. So there are obviously lots more. And I would say that these are the kinds of things that you, you might see more. Um, I mean, the approach that I'm suggesting, I don't think is completely new in the sense that you might see something similar in, in exam course books, although sometimes it focuses more on strategies than the sub skills. But actually, uh, English for academic purposes, you might see these kinds of things there. So listening and note taking, reading and, and uh, identifying cause and effect and things like that would certainly come into play. Then we've got reading decoding skills. Uh, and again, we can help learners with these. So just like before with the listening uh, lesson, what we might do here is do the uh, leading and the gist task and then do some kind of focus on decoding skills, follow them by comprehension questions, because practice of the decoding skills doesn't necessarily show or demonstrate a full understanding of the text. Um, so when we read, we decode letters and we decode words. We identify the subject of the sentence and also the main verb, which is sometimes easy, and sometimes more difficult. So, for example, uh, traveling back and forth between home and work. Is a real pain. That's a really long subject. Identifying clauses, identifying complex noun phrases can be difficult. Recognizing referencing. So when you've got it in a sentence, is it referring back to something? Um, I tried um, garlic ice cream, but I didn't like it. Yeah. It referring back to the garlic ice cream, which is a thing, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, or sometimes it refers forward. So I didn't know it then, but um, garlic ice cream was not for me. Again, recognizing the function of discourse markers and how they shape the conversation. What's what's going to come next? You can predict what you're going to read next. And using affixation to understand new words, really important for working out the meaning of new words that you don't understand. So looking at the prefixes and the suffixes to help you. So those are some of the decoding skills. And as I say, if, for example, you focus on referencing, you might get students to underline can you underline all of the it's in the text and all of the thems and these and those? Now, can you work with a partner and discuss do they, what do they refer back to? What do they refer forward to? And that's a way of doing that particular activity. Um, with affixation, we might get them to uh, look at some words that we think they won't know and try and work up the meaning using the prefixes and suffixes to help them. We might get students to underline the subject of each sentence in a paragraph where there are some complex subjects or long subjects that they have to recognize, something like that. But then we're probably going to want to do some comprehension questions afterwards to check that they've really understood all of the meaning. But by focusing on the decoding skills, hopefully we help them to understand the meaning of the text better. So uh, we're coming and just looking at the time. Yeah, great, good. So um, I just wanted to, to let you know that um, the examples I've shown you today are actually from uh, Roadmap. Richard mentioned that I'm one of the co-authors of Roadmap, which is the new general English course book series for Pearson. Uh, and um, we do have it. So basically we've got uh, in every unit, we've got four main lessons, uh, certainly at lower levels, at higher levels, it works out slightly differently. I worked on A2 and A2 plus, so we've got four main lessons. Each of those lessons uh, leads students to a speaking uh, objective. So there's a very clear speaking outcome at the end of this lesson. And in order to get students to that speaking outcome, they do some reading and listening along the way uh, that helps them to develop some vocabulary, some grammar, something like that. Um, so that they can then produce the language they need to meet the speaking outcome. The way that we deal with reading and listening in those main lessons is actually very similar to how we usually do. There's the lead in the gist, the comprehension questions. Um, but we also, for every main lesson in the book, we also have a develop your listening and a develop your reading lesson. And this is for self-study or for use in the classroom. 
and we follow the, the, the staging that we've looked at today. So you can see here, develop your listening. This is uh, recognizing weak forms. Uh, it's all about food. And um, in, the, in the left hand column at the bottom, you've got your, gist, your leading and your gist task. And then in the right hand column, there's the focus on the, the um, sub skill of recognizing weak forms. There's the practice. And then there's some comprehension questions there to check understanding of that. Then here we've got the develop your reading lesson. And again, you start off with the gist task, sorry, the lead in and the gist task. Then here, the focus on the sub skill is identifying positive and negative points in an article. So there's some kind of language here to help learners look, identify positive and negative points. There's practice of that where learners then read and pick out the positive and negative points that the writer is making about technology in the workplace. So this particular practice of the subskill very much shows that the learners have comprehended the text. So there's no comprehension questions there as such. Then there's the follow up, of course. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, you can go to English.com forward slash roadmap and you can 